Okay, so again, my name is Sang. Uh, for the sake of recording, um, I'm going to talk about a lot of ongoing uh, projects that are happening in my lab, um, which may not look um, coherent to each other, but I try to uh, frame all the projects into this notion of empathy in uh, computing. So, you know, computing, like, you know, computer science folks or researcher or practitioner, they have been working on how we can use technology or um, to, uh, computing devices to facilitate empathy. Um, and some of the well-known projects that are shown here, like, you know, one in the left is called Project Syria, where you can literally, I mean, all of, the, all of them are using VR devices, by the way. So first one is like, you know, being able to experience what it, what it, uh, what it is like to live in Syria in the battlefield. And the one in the middle is being able to live as someone else's body um, so you can see what it feels like to uh, be uh, someone in a different gender or like someone in a wheelchair for example like one on the right is um, being able to experience what um, what it feels like to be uh, a homeless um, so you can clearly see some commonality there like you know all of them are using VR devices and then some, of, I, I think some of the limitation that I could see is that like a lot of the <clears throat> discourse about empathy and computing is centered around uh, immersive storytelling, which is great, you know, but it's, I, I think it's not just um, immersive devices that can facilitate empathy, there could be more, I feel like. And a lot of people are focusing on visual spatial dimension rather, um, and then temporal dimension is kind of overlooked because you know, it's not just like what, what they see, but, but also it could, but what, what they get to be over time. Um, and then like putting them in the right context and then like the context has history and that's sometimes overlooked, I feel like. And, and the other problem is uh, target, you know, the one that we want to empathize with, they're not involved in this process typically. Like, so there's separate speaker or separate mediator who wants to help you empathize with the target uh, and then the target does not it's not in the process in evaluation or something so um, I think that's make, makes it complicated um, than it can be so so I looked at a lot of previous papers on different disciplines about empathy and then and psychologists have two different view on empathy like one is effective empathy the other is cognitive empathy. So effective empathy is like basically the ability to feel another person's emotions. You can imagine being able to read someone else's, someone's facial expression, or maybe being able to uh, recognize whether someone is agitated from, from the phone call or something. Cognitive empathy is uh, active role taking um, um, cognition process, cognitive process to know what other pe person think or believes. So it's more of a cognitive process. So you can imagine that effective empathy is relevant to affective computing where people are using computer to understand uh, what, how, how people are feeling. Uh, and then cognitive empathy, I, um, I'm claiming that this is very relevant to like a lot of the classic groupware work where they talk about shared context and asynchronous awareness so that I get to know better about the situation that people are in uh, and then just providing information could be useful. So I'm more on the side of this right side so that I provide, uh, I, I, I try to provide information and context that they're in that were um, typical in, in a temporal dimension. The other way to break down empathy is um, um, I, I used empathizer and empathizee, like a target. So in, in the discipline of nursing people, uh, one researcher, I don't remember the name, uh, but like this researcher talked about four different components in that empathizer needs to do, um, like perspective sharing, being non-judgmental, so that people feel safe about expressing um, their feelings and then recognizing emotion, which is relevant to affective computing. Uh, affective empathy, and then communicating back what uh, and expressing their empathy to back to the target, uh, and then other 
a researcher from um, anthropology, like social science, they uh, claim that like, it is not just the uh, empathizer's duty, like it's also relevant to target. So target needs to um, express their emotion. For example, like if I don't tell you why I'm mad, like, you know, what happened in the morning, there's no way that you can understand how I feel, like, for example. So providing information could be um, useful. And then in general, self-reflection is very useful. Like, you know, there's a paper about, you know, those who are good at self-reflection is gonna be good at empathizing with other people as well. And then largely uh, understanding community communication and group work for collaboration are the, I think they're the one, um, the, area where we can think about empathy like uh, so um, so these uh, topics that I've uh, had in red is are the one that I focus so I don't try to solve all this problem in one take or one project like I try to break down into smaller problems so if you can understand better about computer community communication um, collaborative, uh, cl creative collaboration is where one place where empathy could have actual utility. So um, those are the four different areas that I'm focusing on. Um, and typically, how I come up, like how I come up with this <laughs> uh, framework, is basically looking at all my all the projects that I do, and then try to categorize, like do some thematic analysis on the project that I do in retrospect. So like on the left side, you can see my Slack workspace. And then I always create a one channel for each project. So you can see there are a lot of different projects. Um, and today probably I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna like introduce some of the projects and they could be categorized into these four um, pillars that I showed you. So, and like, you know, hopefully that will make sense um, towards the end. So yeah, uh, let's look at the understanding computer media communication. Obviously, look, this is not new at all. Like computer media communication has been there uh, since the beginning of um, CSCW and um, social computing. So one project that I'm working on is like, you know, uh, looking at this nonverbal communication in video conferencing, which is, which uh, became really important in this era of pandemic. Um, let me check the time. Okay, yeah, so, you know, in-person communication, you have eye contact, you can, um, that's basically from a way for you to read facial expression. Um, and then it's needed for building trust and mutual understanding. And then in video call, we don't have that. Um, it's the reason why we don't have that is that is the discrepancy between eyes and camera. So uh, let me, I can kind of simulate by, if I look at, I'm looking at um, Mike right now, but it doesn't look like I'm looking at, like, I don't know, Mike will feel like I'm looking at you. And if I look at the camera right now, I'm maybe do you feel better um, or feel more like I'm looking at each one of you. So, but although I'm not looking at you at all. So there's some YouTube video where, you know, in customer relationship, like they, there are a lot of video that talks about, hey, you have to look at the camera and not look at the person on the screen. So it's just kind of deception in a sense, because while if you look at the camera, you cannot read um, their like facial expression, you cannot see what's, you cannot see what's going on. You cannot read the audience. Um, so yeah, so one interesting thing that is happening in video call is that we, look at ourself, right? So there's a small visual of myself and the video call. So I'm looking at myself, uh, not looking at you, which is kind of weird if it was in-person communication, you know, that's pretty unique to video call, right? Like if it was in-person, nobody's gonna look at their mirror to check what they look like, you know, um, but we do that all the time uh, in video calls. So, and um, psychology, some, uh, psychologists found that like this self-focused attention in video chat is uh, correlated um, with the social anxiety disorder. Um, what did I say? Yeah, social anxiety disorder. 
and then it could even cause and maintain social anxiety disorder. So like I'm working with uh, two of my students, Tashif and Somia, they're working on this project uh, where the hypothesis is that, hey, maybe the lack of eye contact in video chat is the reason why we look at ourselves. Like, you know, in-person communication, if, if the, uh, the person on the other side look at me, it's hard to, uh, you know, just ignore and look, at, look away from um, the person. That's kind of like general hypothesis that we have. Um, so we're actually running a study where there's gonna be a moderator who will do a mock-up interview um, as if it was a job um, interview. And then moder like we divided this condition so that like half of the time, like if it was 16 different question, for the eight question, they're gonna look at the camera directly. So the, it's gonna, the other person is gonna feel like them, that they're, um, the interviewer is gonna look at, um, look, look interviewee's uh, eyes. And the other half of the condition, we let uh, we may, we are making the the interviewers to look at the visual, which is on the left side of the screen. So it's going to look like this. So I'm even though I'm looking at the interviewee, uh, what interview is going to looking at is going to look like uh, what you see. Um, and then we're using eye tracker to follow where the participant participant is looking at, where they're looking at the interviewer, where they're looking at themselves in the middle, or and so forth. So. We just started the study, so we don't have uh, any uh, uh, data that can conclude our hypothesis. But here's one data point, like two data points that we have at the moment. So um, let's look at the participant one for now. Um, participant one is, so this is, let me try to annotate if possible. So this is eye contact condition, no eye contact condition. You can see that when interviewer was um, having eye contact, they were, you know, they, they looked at the opponent and they also look uh, monitor themselves, right? Uh, for some amount of time. But when they were not looking at um, the interviewee, they, they look at themselves much more. So you can see this heat map. So this, for this particular person, uh, more self-focused attention in non-eye contact condition. Another person that we did is kind of the opposite. Um, this person, um, so in eye contact condition, they looked at their themselves more. In when there was no eye contact, they looked at the opponent more, which is exactly opposite, uh, like you know, from uh, between participants. So. We can say maybe this, there's some individual difference. Um, there's some other interesting things that are happening. Like they, they like this person focus on face. Um, this person focus on the more like the larger region. Um, but you know, can you guys think? Uh, oops, sorry, there's my cat. Can you guys think which one is more natural? Which one is more likely? If it was you, anybody want to pick a? scenario where you will be in. It seems like the eye contact condition is is more natural. Um, it's interesting to see that though in the non eye cap contact position, uh, they're also looking uh, at the uh, the other individual. Right. Uh, so you think five participant one was more natural. Yeah, I see. Yeah, we, we don't know. We cannot conclude anything at all um, because we only have two samples. Uh, one possible explanation, uh, which we're excited, is that um, participant one, one is, um, you know, from Western culture. Participant two is from East Asian culture. So I don't know if you knew, but like in East Asia, making eye contact means confrontation, whereas in Western culture, making eye contact is showing respect. So it's exactly opposite. So you may feel like I'm, I'm like looking away when I talk like in the lecture, but that's kind of like coded in my gene, like, you know, because I was like, you know, asked to look away when I'm being scolded and when I was a kid, you know? So uh, it could be come from cultural difference. It could be individual difference. You know, there could be some relevance between these pattern and social anxiety level. But we're trying to 
have some large scale data that, that will help us to understand more about this. So yeah, that was actually one project. Um, and let me actually move. Okay, so how do we, how do we enable eye contact in the video chat then? So there has been some approach on, approach like, gra like a computer graphics approach where even though I'm looking at the person on the screen, like, you know, computer vision is going to distort my face uh, and, you know, visual to make it look like I'm looking at you, which is uh, very, you know, interesting. And then um, like, you know, like Microsoft have, is having this one and, and, and NVIDIA is presented this uh, approach a few weeks, a few months ago. I, and but I feel like there's some limitation there. Like you know, what happens if I if I'm not looking at you? Like what if I, what happens if I'm looking at Google Doc, for example? And then there, that means that we're having some sort of deception there. Like do we want this deception? Like even though I'm looking at a cat video, do you want to be like you know? Do you want to feel like I'm making eye contact to you? Like uh, if I want to, if you want to change the algorithm depending on where I'm looking at the visual or Google Doc. Do you want to vary this distortion? Like, you know, that probably means like, you know, you have to share what you're looking at with the computer algorithm. So there could be some privacy issues or it could be simply there's some um, uncan uncanny valley about this distorted face. Like it may not, maybe this person uh, may not look like um, the actual person. So uh, it could look creepy. Um, so simple, stupid approach that we're doing is like building a, a, a physical conferencing system where I position like there, there's going to be a camera where the eyes are and on the screen. So we're building this um, physical kiosk like thing where there's going to be semi transparent system, um, screen where visual will be projected and behind it, there's going to be a camera, uh, which is on an XY plotter and the XY plotter is typically used for drawing, like, you know, um, on the plane, but we use it to change the position of the camera so that it's gonna track the eye position. Um, yeah, this was actually the sketch that that I had even before the project where, like we imagined, well, obviously we're not gonna have this in our modern laptop in any, um, in the near future, but but we can, Think about a conference room or kiosk that has this um, sort of like you know moving camera. Um, one interesting thing about the system is that you can change the person in the screen. They can change their perspective, which means that um, if I'm on the right side of the screen, the camera is going to move to the right, and then that means that what I can see is going to be different depending on where I am on the screen. If that makes sense. So if I move to the right, my camera is going to move to the right too, so that maybe I can see uh, more right side of your room. Like if I stand up and like you know look down, maybe I can see the table of yours. Um, so we're building very, um, you know, like a thing that is good for privacy invasion. <laughs> so. Yeah, this is what we're building. We're collaborating with uh, one of my PhD students is working on it to, to shift and uh, one undergrad students from industrial design are working on this, um, building this physical um, artifact. Another project that we're working on about computer mediated communication, like one undergrad student was interested in this. Hey, like I'm really interested in animated GIF and then let's do some research about it. And then one question that we're trying to answer is that whether I'm gonna choose animated GIF that matches like my identity. Um, sorry about the noise. Um, so like, you know, I wonder if people are going to pick an animated GIF that matches, you know, um, the like the person in the animated GIF, would they match my like gender? Would they match my ethnicity? So, or like how would other people feel about like, choosing different kinds of animated GIFs. So would you feel weird if I choose Captain America? Or would you feel weird if, um, you know, someone picked uh, Ken Jeong, like, you know? Um, so those are the kind of the questions that we are exploring and that we're trying to answer with online study. 
Yeah, so that's kind of the three different projects that we're working on, on the computer meaning communication. And then now we're moving on to perspective sharing. Um, let me see how we're doing on time. So sometimes perspective sharing literally means perspective sharing. Like, you know, like, like when what you see is not what I see, like, you know, there's discrepancy or disjoint between viewport, like that could be a problem in understanding what other people are talking about. So sometimes we just want to share what they see. So like, you know, one example could be in uh, COVID-19 pandemic, like, you know, teaching CS in Zoom is really easy, but like you can imagine other uh, classes could be really uh, challenging. Like for example, like in the left uh, picture, you can see that this trainee um, is uh, mimicking the instructor's pose, which is, uh, forcing her to look away from the screen so they cannot really see the instructor anymore. And the picture in the middle, like, you know, what they want, what the instructor want them, one student to see is not the uh, virtual side, it's about actual physical artifact that they want to share. Like, you know, so how did that happen? Um, so one of the projects that I'm working on is uh, um, Carlos Batista, like his PhD student is working on this um, collaborating with um, uh, professors from uh, industrial design, where they built this camera rig where they put this uh, six different GoPro uh, in each um, side, and then they're, you know, capturing this um, pottery crafting process from six different sides. And what I'm building is this, um, you know, you can go there uh, and then check out what's happening. But this is basically um watching youtube video like six youtube video all at the same time uh, that are synchronized so if you play probably not going to hear any sound but basically you can see the synchronized view of six different video and then imagine that you will be able to navigate in different time spots so that all the videos will be synchronized to each other um, there's a different view uh different layout um but it could be just useful for something else. Like imagine that you want to watch six different live broadcasting of um, presidential election so that you can like switch channel. <laughs> um, but this is what we're doing on this supporting uh, instructor who uh, does like remote class uh, centered around this crafting process because if it was in-person class, they would be able to like, you know, go around the room and then see what's happening. Um, but if it was just um, Zoom class, it would have been just one video that they have to look at and it's gonna be difficult um, for them to like, you know, um, pick up what, what, what this instructor is doing um, if they kind if they of see well from that particular chosen perspective. All right. So that was one project. Um, another project, like you know, sometimes people are in a different reality, so they cannot really see. Uh, I cannot really see what they see. So this was a famous time cover where like people were creating a lot of memes with, <laughs> uh, where you know, uh, people are like having fun with virtual reality, but you have like as a spectator, you have no idea what's going on inside. So. Um, how can you share perspective with VR users? Like, you know, if you go to an exhibition or a conference, how do we, the, if someone is experiencing VR, how do we know what's happening? And probably you may not want to like wait in line and to be part of this um, uh, and, and experience VR because maybe there are too many people waiting or there could be other reason why I would not want to like experience VR. So um, some of the, People could be marginalized in this uh, in this VR experiencing, like simply people who do not want to wait, or people who do not want to wear VR headset for some reason. Like you know, there are a lot of um, articles about you know, like you know, it, it's going to mess up your hairstyle, sometimes makeup, or some people would like you know, I, I have a big head, so it's going to be really difficult <laughs> for me to wear VR headset, and then my hair is really thick, so that it's always going to go up. And then because of my glasses, it's not really comfortable for me. Uh, and then there, do, there are some people who are not recommended to wear headset, like you know, minors, uh, uh, like children under 13, or those who uh, with nausea. So you can 
see that you know some one Facebook employee has to, like he was he had to shave his head to make wearing VR uh, headset easier. So like how do we include these people in this public setting? That was one question that we are going like where uh, we're building this uh, auxiliary device, basically a tablet, uh, iPad uh, with, that can be tracked in the space so that uh, what's on the top right is what's happening in, in, at, in, in current practice, typically. They have no idea what's going on. Uh, but we are trying to be like hand out this extra device that they can see the VR headset user or even maybe interact with this VR headset user. So like maybe they can be they can participate as a game or like, you know, as, as part of the collaborative game where, you know, they are kind of fighting with this VR to user. Um, so, and then I'm obviously I'm working with uh, many people on this project, like, you know, Bill Ark, uh, Zark, uh, and a lot of students from computer science, ISC and visual arts and, and try to make this work. So this was the like simple prototype that we have. So you can see that like this tablet user is able to see what VR headset user is drawing at the moment. Um, so imagine that it could be used in the social setting or public setting. So you can hand out um, tablet device and all the people around you can see, I mean, uh, they can see with the tablet, but if you, even people around you, around the, the tablet user can see what's going on. So you can, scale this um, VR experience to some extent. Okay, so we are at the moment, we are trying to compare um, this system with the virtual camera control and then measure like uh, evaluate their tablet users or like um, computer users immersiveness, situational awareness, co-presence, connectedness, and how well they do in um, tracking or tracing tasks. Then we are working on cross device for our artwork where um, artwork could be seen uh, physically as well as um, virtually. So you can imagine a pile of trash is, uh, you know, um, pile of trash is on in a gallery, which looks awful. But then if you look through this tablet, it's gonna be a completely different thing where, uh, and then they're exactly mapped on, on to each other so that it has this, juxtaposition between two different artifacts. Okay, so that was kind of like a literal perspective sharing and then I'm gonna give you a very short um, intro on what could be non-literal perspective sharing projects. One example that we had was, you know, um, by the way, this, this video is really good to motivate this project. So this comedian is talking about how difficult it is to help their mom on the phone to do something like to delete the YouTube comments because uh, he cannot see what what uh, their uh, his mom was seeing on the phone. So I talk about hey, you have to click uh, this X mark, which means uh, which eventually means that you have to find the right arrow on the screen and then place them on the like X button, and then you have to click the left button, and then that he has to unpack all these um, uh, language. So what we are building is basically, hey, can I generate interactive tutorial that will be overlaid on top of um, existing website by me demonstrating on it. So let's say I want to help my grandpa remotely and then this user can actually open their computer and then click through and demonstrate what needs to happen on the other side. And then that the, the system we're building is going to record the whole process and then generate interactive tutorial that people can follow step-by-step step that will be overlaid on top of existing functions. So you can see at the end of the day here, like, you know, uh, this will part will be highlighted with this uh, visual indicator. And then there could be some textual instruction or like voice narration from this user um, so that they, they, the other person on the other side could click through to accomplish the task. And there are a lot of interesting question about how do we mask uh, privacy, uh, um, you know, private information. How do we pick the target that they have to, we have to indicate? How do we generate instruction that makes sense, not only to the user, but also to the target? Um, so if I say, if I, um, my, if my explanation said, go to setting, like, you know, that's really ambiguous. Like go to setting means that you have to move the mouse cursor to the 
a gear icon and then click the left mu left button of your mouse. Um, so that these like a little bit of unfolding. So my students are working on this project called Remo. Um, oh, the, and another project of this is, uh, this is basically about, um, hey, language could be a barrier in terms of perspective sharing. So we are looking at this uh, Jammu and Kashmir conflict uh, between India and Pakistan. Like this was actually a project for my CSW, CSCW class. And then they just submitted a, a um, full paper to CSCW. So we were waiting for result at the moment, but basically they did uh, temporal analysis on Wikipedia view and how P uh, these articles are edited over time when important thing happened. And we interviewed people and then we translated all the articles into English, English so that we compare uh, between articles. And then what's striking is that, you know, if you look at this, so this is translated wiki articles. And if you read, it's hard to imagine that you could read these sort of things in wiki articles. So in the second quote, it says, why is Kashmir not happy? Um, this is very subjective. And then you know, like, you know, the, the rule of thumb, like the policy in Wikipedia is that they have to, they just have to present the debate. They, they should not engage with the, in debate. So you can see that some wiki editors are clearly having a, um, um, pers uh, like a specific POV on this particular topic. Um, so, you know, we realized that like in some, uh, in Wikipedia article in some language are, are still um, having some um, trouble in maintaining NPOV. So that's what we found. I think it's almost there. Another project that we're working on with my uh, PhD student, he's working on, um, you know, rural areas in Colombia where uh, their actual landmines are uh, placed in region and then like, you know, they, we wanted to understand how people share information this, about this danger, what like route they choose. And then if they want to, if you want to do some technical innovation to help them to share information, what will be the challenge? Like what kind of devices they're familiar with? Like, you know, there are a lot of challenge in terms of information flow between different stakeholders and then technical barriers of um, like infrastructure that they have is not uh, enough for sharing information among civilians who are exposed to this danger. So we are planning an interview study to understand this problem. So I'm gonna skip this. I have this shortcut um, for the sake of time. So this was kind of like a, I don't know, like agenda, like framework that I use to categorize my research agenda. And I'm not saying this is like gonna be useful for um, understanding empathy, uh, empathy or what the empathy is actually, but, but I'm using a lot of different pieces from various disciplines to understand what can we do to facilitate empathy and how can you break down empathy into smaller problem and then we can have smaller sub goals in different regions. So with that, uh, I think that's, I just, you know, introduced a lot of different projects that are, that's happening in the, lab and then I can take any questions if you guys have.